This yeah. conference will now be recorded. And just to just to let you know, those of you who haven't been on the call before or maybe not for a long time, we do record the conferences. If anybody does wish to remain um, anonymous, that's truly fine by us, and we can figure out a way to do it. Um, we record the conference A because some people like to re-listen because they miss stuff, and B because um, some people can't make the meetings, and those who cannot make the meetings come in and listen later. So we get we get consistently around 40, 40 or so hits, 40 to 50 hits a week, and we get an we have an average we have an average watch time of 11 minutes and 52 seconds on YouTube. So there you are. Uh, somebody just called in on the telephone. Who might that be? It's Peter, and I'm driving. Okay, Peter, and you're driving. God bless you. Um, I'll only be on for about half an hour. Okay. Do, do you need to say? Do you need to talk? No, I think I'm okay. Okay. All right. So um, let me run down the list of who I see. Um, Scott Hogan, Michael Tilliard, Carl Foreman, Dennis Correa, Ken Anderson, Richard LaFrey, Mark Perlo, Paul Frieda, Gary Burr, David Muslin, Herb Geller, Russ Smith, Peter Monaco, Ron Boucher, Robert, uh, Wang Gao Shah, uh, Jake, and Peter. Oh, and Jeremy just arrived, I see, whilst I was reading. I think you left out Carl and me, I believe. No, I, I definitely called Carl. I did leave you out, though. Okay. I did call you out, didn't I, Carl? Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that would be like missing Jake, you know. Don't How can you leave Len out? And you and left I, me on. I just assumed he was there, assumed he was ever present. I, it's like I didn't call my own name. You know, it's that's 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 how things go. Um, that was probably the name that I was looking for when I was counting up as well. Yes, the record Sylvester. Oh, oh Sylvester, I didn't I didn't write Sylvester. Thank you, Sylvester. Oh my gosh. You know, the people that are the people that are so are regulars, I like just assume them. All right, thanks. You, remember, you remembered my name, maybe I was uh, stepping up. That, that sounds like Larry Fish. Who was that? Yeah, just wondering if you mentioned my name before. Did you just, you just joined, you just joined. You tried no, to... actually I went to turn my, I don't want to say it, pork chops over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was teaching oh, till eight oh four, but I was here by eight oh five. Okay, just, just oh, saying. Guilty as charged. Guilty. I don't. Charged. I don't need any time. Thank you. Guilty as charged. All right. Um, now I think Richard Afraid has not been on before. Is is that right, Richard? That is correct. Okay. Um, Robert. Have you been on with us before? No. Okay. Um, Wango Shan, I don't think you've been on with us before. Is that right? No, Wango first time. Shan? First time. First time. Okay. Hello. And, first time. Okay. And. Um, is there anyone else I missed who is on here for the first time? Yes, Jerry Burr. Oh, Jerry Burr. And I, that, you were the one that I saw immediately and said, oh, yes, I, I, Jerry Burr. Yes, sorry, Jerry. I recognized you being a first time person. Oh, um, all right. So here we've got four new men. So we will stop by each of the four of you 
I'm going to do my best to get through this segment in an hour. And um, that will give us another hour to go around all the new men, all the other men. And um, we'll check in with any of them if um, we'll check in with them at the time and anyone else who comes in. Is there anybody who has to leave within the first hour other than Peter? Okay, so the system hopefully will work. Rick, Can I'm going to be leaving early, but I don't have anything. I'm just listening in. Right. Okay, Ken. Rick, I'll, okay. I'll leave early. Okay, so um, just let me know if you're leaving early and you need time. If you're leaving early and you don't need time, that's just fine. But I, I don't want you to leave if you had something you wanted to raise. Rick, I saw Herb Geller waving, uh, and his, my, his mic is muted. Thanks. I'm going to leave early. Okay. But I'll, be, I'll try to listen to all the new people. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, new gentlemen, um, what we ask you to do is just give us a really quick uh, summary of your back ground, um, your age, where you're being treated, um, who, uh, where you are in the disease stage, uh, what treatments you've done to date, uh, and where you are at, at right now, and then tell us if there's anything specific that you'd like to run past this group this very knowledgeable group of uh, 29 men you see in front of you. Um, and so Richard Lafrate, are you comfortable kicking us off in that process? Yes, no problem. Please go ahead. All right, I am um, 77 uh, years old. I uh, was diagnosed uh, seven years ago with uh, Gleason 6. And um, I have been on active surveillance all that time. And uh, my, my PSA has increased uh, from uh, 5.8 when it was diagnosed to it's uh, uh, nine, it's about nine, uh, 9.4 right now. Okay. And uh, I have not, have not had uh, any, uh, any, uh, aggressive treatments so, so far. Uh, in fact, I'm, um, I've had two biopsies during this time and I'm uh, resistant to any further biopsies. Okay, um, so let, me, let me stop you, let me stop you um, right there. The, we run nine groups a month, Richard. Yes. And this group is for men who are high risk, um, recurrent or have advanced disease. Okay. All right. I'm in the wrong group then. So the group I think you should be in, in fact, I know you should be in, is the active surveillance group. And they meet at exactly the same time on Wednesday. Okay. And they will give you plenty of time to talk about what do you do now, um, how you've done so far, and what do you do now. My guys okay. don't really relate to your situation our guys here and you um and i don't want them to scare you all right so um i think that and you're very welcome to stay on the call but i don't want to take time because um it's the wrong group right but i understand what we, what we will you telling me that thank you um, are you signed up to our are you signed up for our reminders no Okay, if you want to give me your email, you can send it to me, you can put it in the chat window. I will forward you the reminder that just came out today for the active surveillance group on Wednesday. Well, I, I'm aware of that one. So, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of that group. And I got an email uh, showing your group and I wasn't aware that uh, it was uh, something completely different, so. Ah, uh, okay. Well, then, in that case, I will check the database and take you off of this group. Yeah, that's fine. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye now. Um, all right. Um, let's. Somebody have. Oh, they saw somebody call in, but I guess they they left. It was a call at O2 there for just a sh short moment. Uh, Gary Barr. Yes. 71 hey. years old. Yes. 71 years old, was diagnosed two years ago with uh, Gleason 9 in all areas of the prostate. Um, immediately started ADT. And coming off of that, after exactly two years here next month, I went through high dose brachytherapy, followed by five weeks of external beam radiation. And at this point right now, just monitoring the PSA value, which has been less than 0 0.05 since I went on the ADT. And just uh, probably wanting to know exactly, is there anything that I should be pursuing versus just monitoring PSA values? Okay. Um, and wh where where in the country are you? <clears throat> I'm north of San Francisco, and the uh, high dose brachytherapy was done right at UCSF. Oh right, with um, Joe Shu. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you did high dose with Joe Shu, and did Joe also supervise your your IMRT? Uh, no, that was done up in Santa Rosa with a Dr. Sharfrin for five weeks there at, in Santa Rosa at an oncology center in Santa Rosa. Okay. And, and who was it that had you on the, um, the ADT for two years? Uh, I started immediately when the urologist found the Gleason scores of nine and I've just been following up with Dr. Sharfrin, the oncologist. She's been she's been doing the uh, quarterly injections. Okay, so you so so Sharfrin is a um, is a medical oncologist, and so you've been under her care. And then at the end of the two years, you decided you should do HDR, and um, and IMRT. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, you I did you that. I did that immediately, I, right after right after being diagnosed. Within two months, I did the high dose brachytherapy, followed immediately by five weeks of external beam radiation. And and is Shafrin is Shafrin the uh, the radiation oncologist? Yes, she is. Yes. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Um. Okay. Um. I know some of these people because I lived in Marin for 15 years, and and I was treated. Um, I was treated partially at Kaiser and partially at UCSF. So I that's how I know some of the players. Um, so um, have you st have you stopped your ADT now? I see. I see Dr. Sharfrin uh, in two weeks, and according to her, yes, we are going to stop that after two years. Okay. Was you? What was you? Was your nine a four plus five or a five plus four? Oh boy, I think it was four plus five in all all samples. Okay. And was there anything notable? Was there? seminal vesicle invasion or yeah, anything? Yes, I was going to have radical prostatectomy until they did a, uh, a prostate MRI and found out that it was stage three that had advanced into the seminal vessels uh, surrounding tissue and maybe even questionable the lymph nodes. Okay, but they weren't sure about the lymph nodes. And what was your, how high did you did your PSA get before you you started treatment? It was when I was diagnosed. It was seven. Okay. Um, 
So you now, it's now been, did you say less than 0 0.05? Yes, it has been that way for over a year. I mean, it, it when I started ADT, it just, it went way, it went down considerably. And after three months or six months, it was less than 0 0.05. Point, less than 0 0.05, okay. Um, okay um so you you're wondering whether you're going to come off or you're not going to come off etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm i'm i think i see where you are i have some thoughts let me throw it open first of all start with len len what what, what would you say to gary sounds like he's gotten appropriate treatment he's responded well <clears throat> um yeah you're you're facing the usual uh, dilemma at this point do you stop adt and see what your psa does or do you continue um depending upon how well you're or poorly you're to you tolerated adt um that may influence your decision uh typically guys will ask for a, to go on drug holiday or intermittent adt at this point and see what happens. But what are your feelings about uh, going on drug holiday versus staying on ADT? No, I would, uh, you know, with some of the side effects that have happened to me, I would uh, definitely like to see what happens if I go off of ADT after two years. Yeah, I'd say that's perfectly uh, reasonable. <clears throat> your oncologist will probably go along with that. Um, who yeah, else? Ask a question, Rick. Yes. What when you say ADT, is that the same thing I'm on that abiraterone? Uh, no. ADT, no it's... ADT is androgen deprivation therapy, and so it's it, you are on it, but that's the Lupron. You're getting Lupron and abiraterone. No, I'm just just a Lupron and recently switched over to, and I'm trying to remember the drug. It's exactly like Lupron. It's Eligard, Eligard, Zolodex, Firmagon. But um, Gary, I was talking to Scott. Scott is on, Scott is on um, Lupron and Abiraterone. They're they're running out of Lupron, so they're switching a lot, like to Eligard for a lot of yes. hospitals. Right. Eligard is exactly what I would switch over to. Yeah, to Eligard. Um, who else might like to say anything to Gary, um, who's maybe got a comparable experience, um, diagnosed maybe T3 and went through treatment, and they're coming to the end of the treatment period. We've got a we got a few guys in that boat. Um, Jeff, but it, Jeff is for sure, but he's not with us today. And there's a couple of other guys. And of course, that's that was my story too. So I, I will chime in. But I'm wondering if there's anyone else. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is Carl. Yeah, I haven't heard, heard, uh, heard of Jerry, uh, if you've Jeff. done any um, uh, scams. Originally, I, I, I did go through a couple of bone scans, which were negative. I haven't been uh, probably over a year and a half since I had the last bone scan. Well, I, I, mean, I think Carl. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I wonder if it's time for him to get a medical oncologist that uses. Well, I, I think the issue, Peter, because I was in the same boat, is you've got to see where, where the treatment is first. You got if the treatment could have been successful, like thank goodness it was for me. So I think it's early to get a medical oncologist. Um, I, I, I think that what I well, let me tell you what my situation was. Okay, let me just put in, 
we got to put in Peter's name there so we know it's Peter on there we go um, so I I was also diagnosed uh, T3 um, in fact it was Shinohara at UCSF that diagnosed me T3 I wasn't diagnosed T3 at Kaiser um, and I did the I did two and a half years same thing um, and I did low dose brachytherapy and um, IMRT. Now, seminal vesicles tends it tends to be if it's in the seminal vesicles, it tends to have been already more aggressive, which is a downside. I think what you've got to do, Gary, Jerry, is let yourself figure out where you are which means that at some point very soon stop the ADT and, and monitor your PSA. And it can take a while for your PSA to, to register. Um, I don't know how long it'll take to register, but it can take a while for your PSA to register. Everybody's different. Mine started to show after about six months. I think August, I think I came off in February. I don't think I got a reading in May, but I got a reading in August. And then you've got to watch it. Now the problem, and don't be freaked out by this, is that most likely your PSA is going to climb and it's going to keep climbing. Mine climbed for a year. And all the time, Mac Roach, who at the time was the head of the department, and he was my guy, said, oh, it's going to come down, it's going to come down. It did come down, but it took a year to come down. And I just hung in and I waited. So we'll support you. Keep coming back to this forum and we will support you. But don't be freaked if your PSA gradually starts to climb because it could also do that. There comes a point in time and you really have to trust your radiation oncologist and I would include Joe Shu as well as um, Dr. Shafrin um, in the decision when, you, when, when to start to retreat. But I also don't think that, you know, to sign up, I mean, I didn't want to sign up with a medical oncologist until I knew whether my treatment had been successful. And you, it the only way you can do that is with time. Does that make any sense, what I'm saying to you? Yes, absolutely. I just, uh, how often did you, uh, after coming off of ADT, did you have your PSA tested? Uh, regularly, because Kaiser was willing to do, Kaiser did it monthly. They did my PSA and my testosterone monthly. Monthly, okay. I, I will know, discuss that. I will discuss that with Dr. Sharfran. I did, I would say six weeks um, pro at the most, you know, but also make sure you get your testosterone checked because you want to know that your, testo with your testosterone is coming back. Yes, I understand. Um, okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to... Um, Want to chime in here? Okay. Um, the one thing, um, Jerry, if you're not signed up to our group, um, either t uh, put your email in the chat window, send it to me, I'll make sure you get signed up, or you can go to our website and sign up yourself. I am I am getting the uh, weekly announcements concerning the time of it. So so am I signed up because of that? Yes. If you get you. announcements, you're signed up. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Robert left. Maybe this was the wrong group for Robert too. I saw him pull out. Um. Let's move on to uh, Wang Gao Shan um, and see um, what your situation is. Um, 
talk to us, Gaoshan. Tell us what you're, um, what's going on. Okay, I, I'm not sure if I'm in the right group or not either. However, um, I had a rising PA, PSA, and at one point back in March of 2013, it peaked at 12.1. Uh, and in, in April of 2013, I had my prostate removed. Um, in uh, July of 2013, I had my PSA tested. Uh, it was uh, not zero, but 0 0.04. After I had my biopsy done in the March time frame, I was three, three plus three. Uh, but after the biopsy came out, uh, it was three plus plus four after the prostate had been removed. Okay. My PSA remained my PSA remained quite low until about three years ago, uh, below the the uh, point point three. Except a couple of times, unfortunately, I took some kind of supplement that had uh, something that spiked it up. But as soon as I stopped taking it, went back down. But as of three years ago, it started rising. Till November of last year, it was in the one one point two one point three. And uh, prior to that, once it got to one, my doctor had put me on for a, a two a three month period a drug from uh, I believe it's made in the UK called uh, flutamide, mm -hmm. and I took that and it helped to reduce it. But uh, then in January, it jumped all the way up to two point seven seven. So um, at that time or no, excuse me, 2.66. And at that time, they were talking, well, if it goes above three, we need to look at doing Lupron or something else or uh, or some other stuff. I had to come, I live I live in Taiwan right now, uh, and that's where my doctor ha has been, but my surgery was actually done at a major hospital in, in Shanghai, China. Okay. And so I came to the U.S. to see my son, and unfortunately, when I was getting ready to fly back to Taiwan on March 18th, uh, hmm. the plane was canceled, and I've been stuck in Canada ever since. So in the meantime, I reached out to the BCCA, uh, British Columbia Cancer Association, was able to get an appointment with a doctor named Dr. Peacock, and got in to see him, and. Uh, he basically said, well, you know, your, your, your treatments have been kind of not the way that I would have done it. Uh, you know, uh, we probably would have not given you the, the, the flutamide. We would have waited until we got to three. We would have watched it and then done Lupron or something else. But now because you've had kind of a disjointed uh, treatment plan, different than what I would do, through a number of different applications and things that we see from research. Um, in your case, we, I, I probably would not do uh, Lupron therapy or whatever drug is available at three because the, the research and the results show that all the way up to nine, nine or 10, there in your case, probably wouldn't make any difference. So we wouldn't start with that. Um, so I've been, I've met, met with him w w just one time, I had follow up with some questions and things. Um, he mentioned to me that I've had, um, five bone scan, no, yeah, five, bo six bone scans now, and all of them have been negative. I had an MRI in July of 2019 and it was negative. And then I mentioned that the doctor decided that he wanted to do a PET scan. However, it wasn't the PSMA PET scan that's done at a few places around the world, like UCLA, Heidelberg, and Australia, and a few other places. It was a, a, a sugar-based uh, PET scan, which he said was totally useless and wouldn't show because the prostate-specific would be more applicable and would show where indeed your uh, right. uh, uh, you know, 
right uh, hot point hot points are in your body yeah exactly and and so in the meantime i contacted the one in heidelberg and i got some forms into them but they received everything but they haven't done anything and because i live live in taiwan and now kind of concerned about maybe am i getting the right advice if the doctor's not so clear on hey this is uh, the PET scan we're going to do when there's something that's more correct. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm at. Well, let me first tell you, you are in the right group. So okay. You are definitely, you are definitely in the right group. Um, okay. I think you probably would have been treated a little differently in this country. Let, I have one question, which is, um, the t when when by the time your PSA got to two point six six, were you still on flutamide? No, I had stopped in November because we wanted to see, and from not using flutamide, it jumped up. Uh, I have to look at the report, but I think it jumped up from one point eight to two point six six, or one point nine to two point six six. Flutamide is going to, flutamide will typically halve your PSA. It just does that. And it doesn't do it having anything to do with the cancer. So if you're on flutamide. Oh, no, I, understand. I understand that. Okay. So flutamide dutasteride, you've got to double it. But, but the 2.66 was a clean reading. Well, correct. And, okay. and, and total... I took flutamide for about a total of probably seven months over the course of time, seven, well, eight months. I, if it were me, I would be very dubious of the advice you're getting from your Canadian guy. Okay. And what I would be doing is trying to get a, um, a good scan right now. There are a couple of places you can get PSMA scans in the US um, and pay for them. Um, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Or the other alternative is an Axiomin scan, um, which is a bona fide scan. It's not um, uh, the, con the, the, the agent, it, I don't think is sugar based, but I've got to, I've got to defer to, my, to, uh, to, 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 to Mr. Sierra and Mr. Geller to correct me on that. Um, but I do know that it is a bona fide. I forget what the um, what the the name of the agent is. Um, Axiomin. Sorry, the Axiomin agent. Oh yeah, that it's a synthetic amino acid. They call it flucyclovine. Flucyclovine, right? Now, um, who would like to talk? I mean, some of you on this call for sure have had recurrent disease. It's come back and you have debated whether you should jump on it or you should not. Some of you has come back right away, but is there anybody who on the call where the disease has taken a few years to show its ugly head again? No. Okay. So, okay. So, well, with mine, uh... I meant, I meant, I meant, I meant, let's meant, let's uh, do Ron because we're getting feedback from him. Okay. Um, so, sorry, start again, Mike, Michael Tilliard. Okay, with mine, I was, um, my PSA was undetectable for 10 years. And uh, then it started slowly rising, and I had the, um, prostate bed radiation on that and then uh, after a couple of years it was PSA was going up I had bicalutamide for 18 months with Elagard and um, but then the last few months the PSA started doubling so I'm now on um, well they did a bone scan and found one bone met in L5 and uh, so I've been on enzalutamide. Okay. So, that, so that's the, and so and after a month on enzalutamide, 
My PSA has gone down from uh, four point two to zero point five. Um, so we'll come back to you. We'll come back to you for sure, Michael, because I want to take proper notes. But in in what is your advice to Gao Shan in terms of um, how long he should wait? And when he intervenes, how he should intervene and what he should do. Yeah, I don't think I really have the same kind of experience as Gao Shan to, to advise. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, Mark Perlow, you, you clearly want to come in on this. Uh, you're muted right now, so unmute yourself. Hey, Rick, one thing I wanted to say, when I had the 2.66, that test was done January 21st of 2020. But before I saw the, the doctor in Vancouver, BC, I had another PSA test and it was 2.73 or 7.2. Yeah. That, so know, in a period of, of five months and change, it went up a bit. Well, not really, because because the tests are not done on the in the same lab, and that that's close enough that it can right. be identical. So I would discount okay. that as, as laboratory error. Mark, you're no longer muted. Okay, thank you. So um, I had gotten the uh, PSMA scan at UCLA as part of the study. There's also a study with PYL at Columbia University where they also combine liquid biopsies. Um, at um, UCLA, they don't care what your PSA is before going into the study. At UCLA, it has to be over two, so you could be eligible for that. There are other centers doing it, but it, for me, it was very helpful. I had done Telsa Pro, and when I did the PET scan, found out that um, I had involvement of the seminal vesicles. So later on, that's an issue that I'd like to uh, get some feedback about what I have planned for that. But I'd get the PET scan. I think it's uh, a better tracer uh, with uh, PSMA, gallium, or PYL than Axiomen. The Axiomen has about 50 to 60% sensitivity and is not as specific as those other two agents. Yeah, I agree with everything that was said. Um, and we, I was going to tell you that UCLA does have a uh, scan available. I think it runs about $2,500 up to $3,000, if I'm not mistaken. I, uh, I paid $2,795. And uh, I'll tell you, the people there were absolutely amazing. Great care, great communication. I have nothing but positive things to say on that and then what I'm planning on my next stage. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else want to want to chime in? Len, what, what are your thoughts on all of this? I, I agree with what Mark said that um, if he can, if, if uh, Gaoshan can afford it, uh, the uh, PSMA scans, whether it's Gallium 68 or PYL, uh, would be his best choice is to see where the cancer is right now and then he can determine what treatment would be appropriate yeah i mean i think it's time to get a scan that would be the first step gaoshan and if you can get and you can probably get one as we say um if you're on the west coast if you're in bc then you can probably get one in in um in uh, in UCLA, if you can get down there and um, and definitely see whether that's showing any evidence of metastasis or not. If it is, then we'll talk about what you do next. But one thing is for sure, you'll need a good genito urinary medical oncologist at that point in time. Right. And, and we can guide you to one, um, there are a couple good ones, not too many, but there there is one good one that I'm aware of at University of British Columbia. Um, and um, but there's there's there, there are there are many good ones at University of Washington in Seattle. 
um, and then anywhere else in the U.S. that you you know that you care to go. Um, I um, I don't know that they would have let your PSA go much above two in the U.S. And and I certainly don't know where your doc's coming from when he says that they would let it let it you go all the way up to ten at this point in time. Does well, what he what he said because my he said if it was his decision and he'd been under I'd been under his care uh, at where I'm at now he would recommend to start start treatment but he said hey really need to get a PS MA scan, but but because of your situation where it's been all over the map, I mean, um, uh, and you haven't had the treatment that I would have done from the beginning, uh, I might let it go go even higher because in some tests uh, or studies, it's proven that there's not a big difference in the results. So, but if it was you under my care from the beginning, I would have been yeah. been getting ready to start. Uh, the treatment with you uh, now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, said I, the I, first thing was you need to get the PSM A scan done. Um, but what I'm saying is, I don't know what studies he's referring where it makes no difference if you wait till 10 versus starting it, uh, intervening it around uh, at a much lower level of around two. Uh -huh. um, that 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 that's what I'm saying. It, uh, Anybody familiar with the studies as to when to intervene on recurrence? I'm just wondering whether uh, yeah, Shan has looked at getting a PSMA in in BC. I mean, my problem living in Alberta is that it's not accessible to me because I'm not a resident of that province. No, presumably, I, I was I was told by the doctor at BCCA that the closest one that they've worked with, there's nothing in BC that he's re referred people to uh, UCLA. Uh, numerous people have gone there and he's aware of the, of the testing done in Heidelberg and also I believe Australia, but he's never recommended anybody to go. He's never you know, had anybody go there. Oh, I thought they were uh, conducting them in BC. Well, clinical trials. Well, I, I would have I would have to check, but that's not not what he said. Oh, what he what did I say is, what he told me was that because I'm not a Canadian citizen, to get in a trial would be very difficult. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Probably because you're not. Resident. Yeah, I, I have a U. I have a U.S. passport. Okay. Yeah. Well, with it, Herb Geller, go ahead. Uh, my own sense. I always come back to this same story: is that it really the treatment is going to be guided by the state of your disease, and I think right that PSMA PET scan is can provide a lot of information at this critical point. Right. Because it will tell us where this where this PSA is coming from, and I find I think that's going to guide treatment more than anything we can say here. No, I agree with you. Yeah, I, no, I think we're all agreed on that. Um, I think the issue is um, really where to get it if if it's available in Canada well, or yeah. if he has a U.S. passport, UCLA. Yeah, that's what I would say. I okay. I would get on your bike and get over to UCLA sooner <laughs> rather than later. But I, I'm more interested, and Herb's right. I mean, what, what we see is going to dictate how you're treated. But I'm just saying that um, certainly in the past, um, I know that um, at UCSF, that um, the Peter Carroll would intervene somewhere between 0 0.75 and 1.25. Some of the docs would intervene around two. Um, I mean, I've heard of docs who go as high as um, uh, 10, but not anymore. That was that. This is like a conversation from 
eight or nine years ago, we used to hear that, of doctors leaving it till it would go to 10. We don't hear about that anymore. So, so that's what I would say. Plan. What, what would the, so let's assume a doctor would intervene at this PSA level, what would be the appropriate treatment? Let's say without a scan. Let's say we make an assumption that, the, that there's something there that we want to treat. Well, well, I mean, before we were able to determine the extent of the metastasis, where the PSA was coming from, um, a man would have been placed on androgen deprivation therapy at that point. And then would have done it and maybe then then around 2011 12 the whole conversation of intermittent came in and, and what have you but that's that's what would have been that's what would have been done but you know you've got to you i i think that that with gaushan's situation the fact that he was a three plus three they upped him to a three plus four rp thank god his disease was not that aggressive. It doesn't have the pattern of a very aggressive disease, but evidently it has metastasized. So what they would do next, they take all that into consideration. Okay. Okay, so I would be able to go online, just look for UCLA um, PSMA test to, 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 or how would I contact them? I think we have, I think we have some references. Clinicaltrials.gov would have that and just put in prostate cancer, PSMA, and Los Angeles. Um, if you are a U.S. veteran, um, it's free at no. the VA hospital, which is about a mile away from UCLA. So one person on the group here had gone to the VA and uh, when I was out at uh, UCLA. Not a problem to find the uh, research person coordinator for that study is a woman named uh, Han Thin or Thin Pan. I'm not sure which is first and which is last, but you'll see her listed in the clinicaltrials.gov. She's very responsive and will get you all of the paperwork you need. You will need a sign off from a physician referring you to the study, but it, it wasn't a problem at all. Yeah, the, the gentleman, yeah, the doctor is already in BC has already told me that. Um, Lynn, was there a link to that study in the uh, Edel, Alan Edel's recent article, or was that only for, um, for clinical stuff? Uh, are you talking about the sensitivity of the different scans for diagnosis or something else? No, didn't didn't Alan Adele just do a do a piece on um, P on um, PSMA? But I think it might have been only for um, for um, uh, for management. It might have only it might. I don't know if it was for scanning. I think it was only for. Yeah. Uh, lutetium. Yeah, yeah, that he's he shouldn't be looking at that just now. No, no, no. I'm saying, was there a was there a study? Was there a link to the PSMA study in that article? Yeah. So I just yeah. put a a URL for UCLA PSMA study in the chat box. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. Yeah, I found I found the uh, prostate okay. uh, cancer clinical trials with a request for an appointment and a phone number. Okay, uh, Gaushan, we go. We really got to move on, but okay, go ahead. There is a link there. Herb Gallas put a link in there. You can go to clinicaltrials.gov, and you might well find it there too. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so what I was talking about was that Alan Adel in the last week or so published an article. I thought Len, you blogged it, didn't you? I can't remember. I think I did too. Yeah. Um, and 
And he, what he did is he summarized all of the um, PSMA trials that are going on for managing the disease, not for scanning the disease. Um, and I suspect if you go to our blog, you'll find it on the blog pretty recently. So um, if you if you if somebody sees it and, and it is there and we were right, please put it in the please put it in the chat window. All right, let me run down and see who would like some time today. Is there anybody else? There are a couple of names. I think Tom Guffrey was on for a moment and he left. He's a great old name that has we haven't seen for a while. And there was somebody called Joe, Jim McCore. I'm not sure who that is, but he left. So um, I guess people are not full of patience today, but it works for us because we've got a lot of people on the call. So let me run down and see who needs some time. Um, OK, uh, I'll start with Len. You have an update, Len, so I'm going to put you in for a couple of minutes. OK. Um, Scott Hogan, would you like some time? Uh, just a minute, please. Yeah, just one minute. Thank you. Yes. OK, guys, don't try to estimate how much time you want. Just tell me if you need it or not, because the estimates are never that good. Um, Has anybody ever seen a minute? Ever? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make you the timekeeper, Fish. Be careful. And then you're going to have to come in. You're going to have to figure out with the hook. You remember that old TV show with the hook? <laughs> the gong show. <laughs> the gong show. And with a, at the end of the minute, you put out the hook and you schlep them off. That's it. Okay. Michael Tilliard, would you like some time tonight? Uh, yes, please. Sure. Carl, oh, would you like time? Uh, yes. Uh, Dennis, would you like some time? Dennis Korea. No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Ken Anderson, anything for you tonight? No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Um, Mark Perlo, you definitely want some time. You mentioned that to us for yes. sure. Uh, Paul Frieda, anything for you tonight? Yeah, a short one. Okay. Uh, David Muslin, anything for you? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Herb, anything for you tonight? Okay. Uh, Russ, anything for you tonight? Is Russ, did Russ leave us? Russ may have left us. I don't see him. Um, Peter Monaco, anything for you, sir? I know, Rick. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ron Butcher left. Um, Robert left. Um, Jake, would you like any time tonight? Okay, Jake may not be participating. Larry, would you like any time tonight? No, thank you, Rick. Thank you, anyway. No, okay. thank you, Rick. No, thanks, Rick. Okay. Um, Sylvester, anything for you? No, thank you. And last but not least, Jeremy, anything for you tonight? I have a quick question, yeah. Quick question. Okay. And this All is right. Les, so I don't have anything either. Oh, gosh, Les. Les, I didn't call your name out because you're not on my list, so you never told me I didn't call your name out. Well, I wasn't sure if you read it or not, but I, I don't have anything anyway, so. Neither a company of errors <laughs> between the two of us. I thought, I thought we were waiting for an update from you, Les. Didn't you just have some kind of, uh, didn't you have a meeting with Quan? Yeah, last week. Yeah, we, we, we referred on that last week, so there's nothing, there's another one coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, but uh, nothing yet. Yeah, we talked about it um, at some length last week, Len. 
Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, um, let me start with the, let me start with Len. Len, tell the guys. Yeah. Visit with Dr. O. Right. Well, I, I like to give a little context because I'm sure guys don't memorize my or anybody's past history, except you, Rick, you've got the database. <clears throat> so anyway, diagnosed in 2014, Gleason 9, extra prostatic extension, seminal vesicle involvement, pelvic lymph nodes, Gleason 9, I said that. Um, uh, eventually, I had radiation, intermittent uh, ADT over the last uh, six years, and finally, um, uh, when I was down in Florida three months ago, PSA for the first time ever in six years for me, it was undetectable, but their undetectable limit was 0 0.06. <clears throat> so, so anyway, I, I, at the time I was on uh, darolutamide and Lupron. Okay, fast forward three months to about a week ago. Uh, I met with Dr. O in uh, Mount Sinai, Manhattan, and um, I was starting to get, you know, that stuff a lot of us get on Lupron in your hand, your joints hurt and trigger finger and all that. And I was getting a little shortness of breath. So I told him I, uh, if if he was agreeable, I wanted to drop the Lupron and just stay on the darolutamide. Oh, and by the way, my PSA uh, was uh, 0 0.02, which is the lower, the that's at the level of detection at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> so um, he said, okay, I, I had a couple of uh, bone nets diagnosed last year, just around this time. So he said, well, I, I, I have to tell you the standard of care is for guys like you to be on Lupron the rest of your life. However, I'm not strict about that. I, I understand, you know, guys want certain quality of life. So, you know, if if you want to drop the Lupron and just go ahead with the darolutamide, I, I support that. Uh, so that's what I, I did. I, I stopped the Lupron oh, and already the, the pain in the joints and the finger is gone. Um, still have a little shortness of breath on uh, you know, exercising, a little strenuous exercise. Uh, that'll take a little longer, I'm sure. So I want to see if, um, in fact, the shortness of breath was due to the Lupron and not to some cardiovascular issues. Um, so I'll have a, another PSA in six weeks. That's it. Okay. So any any questions for Len? That's Len, awesome, I, Len. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I was happy with it actually. So um, have you had any discussions as to if you were to come off when actually you'll come off this time around? Uh, as usual, that'll depend on the PSA. If it starts going up, you know, at, at some point, at some predetermined level between that, that Dr. O and I decide on, you know, I'll go back on, um, on Lupron or Maybe I should let it get to a level where I can have another scan. Oh, so, I mean, are you actually off now? Did you decide to come off? Or are you- Off of Lupron, off of Lupron but not darolutamide. And what about the darolutamide? I, I'm still taking that. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, uh, for me, darolutamide is like a placebo. Uh, I, have, I have no side effects whatsoever. Mm hmm So for me, it's like if I'm off Lupron, I'm on drug holiday. Right. As far as I feel physically. Right. As far, I mean, of course, the only issue there, Len, is that um, the morphing issue. You know, you're still on the darolutamide from the standpoint of the the, the cancer is figuring out how to work its way around the darolutamide. Right. So, right. Well, but anyway, it's very good that you didn't get another. It's very good that you didn't get another hormone shot. So. 
Hey, hey, Lynn, it's Ken Anderson. Where's your T levels at at the moment? Oh, you know, they didn't do a T level now that I think about it, and they should have. I wish they, I wish they had. I'm sure it was, um, you know, in the mid teens as it has been ever since I started Lupron. Of course, um, now that I've stopped Lupron and I'm just on darolutamide, I'm sure that will go up. Did you notice a drop when you started darolutamide? A drop in the T level? Yeah. Uh, not really, because I, I started both at the same time. OK. All right, thanks. Yep, sure. Len, it's uh, David Meslin. I have a question. Why yeah. stay on the dilutamide? What's the thinking behind that? Uh, why stay on darolutamide? Yes. Um, well, because it can still control the growth of the cancer, and yet uh, I don't have side effects. Got it. Something better than nothing, and like you said, it's like a placebo, basically. I mean, it's kind of it's an experiment. You know, I, I'm curious to see if just being on darolutamide alone can actually continue to lower the, the PSA to undetectable. I'll find out in six weeks. <clears throat> OK. But, Looking forward to hearing more. Yep. OK. Um, Scott, what's on your mind? Well, thank you, Rick, for asking. Um, first, I've been in teaching. I, I, I'm a high school teacher. I've been doing this virtual thing now for three weeks. And uh, I got to tell you, Rick, I do I empathize, uh, sympathize? I don't know. But when on the screen, I demand, administration demands that I see the faces at all times. Nobody, people can mute, they want to mute everybody, but I got to see everybody the entire time. Otherwise I mark them absent. So I, I said to Lynn, I said, I can't see half the people here. And, I, and this is just kind of a joke that in the virtual, they want to, the admin wants to see everybody face up. They can't have hoodies. They can't just have their head showing. I mean, their hair showing. So I've really learned a lot in the virtual uh, delivery. The second thing, when I heard today that uh, J Lo and what is it, A Rod put forty million dollars down in a home in Florida, and I thought, you know what, that that money could have so well gone to cancer treatment and can. So here's my here's my pitch. I finally take take this very seriously. The donation message that is sent, and I. I've started doing a monthly donation, and I, I guess, and I don't mean to sound pointed, but I, this is to honor the efforts of everyone in ANCAN, especially Rick and the others like Len, who's presented so many times. I, I just think, and forgive me for saying this, but it's almost like a church donation. It's really important to make that donation if you can, and I know it's tough. Hey, believe me, I don't make a lot of money as a teacher, but... I just something moved in me the other day and I said, I've got to start a regular donation plan. And that's that's all I'm gonna say. I just it, it means well, a lot to connect and to listen and learn and hopefully be part of the community. So thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And um we we don't hard sell our donations. Those of you who have been with us for a long time know that. Um, we only do a campaign once a year at the end of the year and between the rest of the time we get donations and we just thank people when they when they send them in I try to thank everybody personally um, and I really appreciate you saying that um, but I what I really want to ask you is you mentioned to me that you're having real problems with the fatigue and I think what we should talk about for you is ways that you might combat that fatigue, because I think that's very important. And I said to you when we spoke, it would be really good to ask the guys. So who has tips for Scott 
on how to combat the fatigue. Anybody? Drink plenty of water. So Ross is telling you to drink plenty of water. No, that's Paul. Oh, that was it's cool. bloody hard in Phoenix this time of the year. It's so damn hot to get exercise in. Right. Yeah, and all the gyms are closed. Has right. anybody done Qigong? Has Qigong, anybody done Tai Chi? Good question. Has anybody done Tai Chi or Qigong in this group? No, just yoga. I just started and it's it's really been remarkable. It's taken about six weeks because it's very slow. It's very slow. So it's something you can definitely do at home. But I've found that the more calm I got, the more energy I've had. So did you start with a video or how'd you start? I did, I, I, I did. There's a guy, out, a master in New Mexico and he has a number of videos available on YouTube. Um, he certainly has online classes as well. And I'll actually post one of his YouTube videos and it'll connect up to um, um, his uh, website. But it's been very helpful for me. I'd appreciate and, that. I, I would be interested. Because I've not been able to go out to the gym like all of us. And I, yeah, I don't know if you guys seen it, but I used to go to the gym four or five times a week, uh, cross train yoga, uh, an intense yoga, not not the Zen kind of yoga, but very hard yoga. And this pandemic, you know, Scott and, uh, you know, living in isolation has really put a hamper on, um, you know, physical exercise, getting out, especially when it's hot like this, and depending on where you live, um, it can be very difficult getting outside to even walk. Um, so I've found this uh, this uh, uh, qigong to be incredibly helpful, and I'll, I'll post a link uh, shortly to it, and you guys can just check it out. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I know Scott that Dennis Career is taking to cycling his bike early in the morning. Sure. Um, Excellent idea. And so that's a possibility to, if, if you can, uh, if you can get up early enough to get your bike. I think the Qigong is a great idea. Um, you know, there's a spe and the Tai Chi because they have practices that focus on how to energize yourself. So, you know, a lot of the, the Asian arts um, have those practices on how to energize yourself. Um, but, you know, of course, we always say exercise, but we're thinking about hard physical exercise, but there's other types of exercise too. Um, anyone else before we move along on how you've handled the fatigue? Thank you. I wanted to add something with what Scott said with regard to donations. Um, everybody, I think most everybody orders from Amazon. And if you, uh, you, you're able to, uh, to designate a charity and then they send a percentage of everything you buy to your charity. And so, uh, so I've got, um, you know, um, Ancan is my charity and I, you know, I spend several hundred or more dollars every month at, at Amazon. So, uh, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but it just uh, happens all the time. And so it's very easy to sign up at Amazon for that. And that's, uh, that if a lot of people did that, I think it would, you know, add a fair amount of money to the coffers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, we're listed there as Answer Cancer Foundation, and uh, we get a half of um, one percent, and it does mount up. You're right. So if people sign up on Amazon, and um, yeah, with fifty people, it make a big difference. Yeah, and um, speaking, speaking of which, I think our swag is going to be on our website this week. I'm hoping if Jackie can get it on, we've decided what how to put it on the website. It looks good. I'm just waiting for her to do it. So, oh, somebody's up. Oh, Russ has got a shirt, and and I actually have a shirt now. I'm not wearing it, and I just bought one as a birthday present. They make wonderful birthday presents. Is this I the one Jeremy's, that's? Uh, 
Yeah, is this the one that's based in Minnesota, it says, Shakopee Answer Cancer Foundation? Yes, that's us, Shakopee okay, Answer Cancer Foundation. I, I just signed up. I don't Thank spend you. hundreds, I spend thousands every month, so you'll get a check. <laughs> well, get yourself one of our shirts, too. Do you, do you see what our shirts say? Did you see, Jeremy, what our shirts say? It, it's so small. It says, be your own best advocate. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we want to get those shirts in front of the doctors. That's what we want to do. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to keep moving. And thank you, everybody, for doing our pitch for us. We don't like to do it as often as we should at Tangan, and but that's how it is. Um, Michael Tilliard. Okay, I, just, I summarized my situation earlier, and uh, on my first appearance here, Rick had uh, suggested I investigate opportunities for a PSMA pet in Canada, and Rick kindly referred me to some Canadians that might have um, that have uh, undergone this kind of treatment. But I discovered that even as I live in Alberta, I can't get this kind of treatment because you have to be residents of Ontario or British Columbia to be eligible. And well, I've talked to somebody here about possible clinical trials in Alberta in the next few months, so that may happen. So um, other than that, I guess I would be uh, It'd be appropriate to go to U UCLA in due course. But what, uh, as I said, my PSA after starting the enzalutamide a month ago uh, went down from 4.2 to 0 0.5, which I gather is what should happen. Um, but, I, but after a few, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started getting this pain in the sort of right knee. It was like it was sciatica. Um, well, it's a sort of dull pain, and I talked to my oncologist. He said because my PSA was going down on the enzalutamide and um, Eligard, then it that this is counterintuitive. So. Uh, I just wonder what people thought about that kind of pain. I, years ago, I did have a sciatica-like pain, but it was, that was a bit different from what I'm getting now. But when I walk, when I go walking, I'm okay. It's more just when I'm sitting than mm -hmm. when I wake up in the morning. So I just wondered if people had that kind of experience. Because I do have the, the one bone met in L5. Um, and th th are you tying, are you correlating this with starting enzalutamide or did you have this pain before you started the enzalutamide? No, I didn't have it before the enzalutamide. So, but okay. then the, you know, the, the, the oncologist said they'll monitor it because it's counterintuitive. This is <laughs> definition yeah. of what's going on here. Well, um, any, anybody have any thoughts on this this nerve pain starting? I mean, would you think it's related to the enzalutamide? Not related to the enzalutamide? What 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 do people think? Well, I read it might be because of the pressure from the. Um, from the cancer cells in L5 on the nerve. Could be. Could, I mean, yes, that's the obvious, but somebody was going to say something. Who was going to say something? That was Sorry. David Messon. How long, Michael, have you been on the enzalutamide? Oh, just for about uh, six weeks now. Yeah, I've got, I was going to, that was my issue that I was going to bring up, so I'll keep listening. Same oh, okay. problem. <laughs> Let's talk about both of you at the same time. Okay. 
Um, so I'll bring everybody up to speed real quick. So I started, I've been on Lupron for uh, six months and I got on the enzalutamide six weeks ago. And the last two weeks, especially the last week has been what, what, what I was warned of in this group is extreme, extreme, uh, extreme fatigue, um, body, uh, bone aches like I've never had. Um, I had a major colitis flare up and actually hit me cognitively a little bit. And, um, and I, I was running, I was biking and all of a sudden I couldn't do any of that. And I finally got off the enzalutamide Friday night and, um, and I'm starting to come around a little bit, but it, it really, it's just unbelievable how it kicked my ass. Just like Glenn said, it was going to kick my ass. Well, I've been very lucky because apart from the usual hot flashes, I haven't, I've been able to bike quite re regularly and walk and uh, it's just in this sort of dull leg pain. It's not crippling, but I just wondered what others might have thought. So uh, well, I'm happy for that. Uh, we'll get some feedback in a minute, but let's just, on, so you're, you're having issues with the leg pain. David, you're having issues with fatigue, and what else? Fatigue, uh, foot pain, actually. I came up with foot pains, which I never had running after all these years, and, uh, and a colitis flare-up. And a colitis flare-up, OK. Um, and, some, and, some neg and some very negative thoughts. OK. Um, so um, Len. You've, you've done enzalutamide, Jake's done enzalutamide, anybody? I, mean, I didn't do enzalutamide. Oh, you did abiraterone for a short time, right? So right. Who, who's, who's done enzalutamide on the call? You know I have, Rick. Uh, okay, go ahead, Ken. You know, it's one that it's, it's a tough drug. It gets into your head pretty quick. And, um... You know, I really didn't find any way to resolve it other than to get off it. You know, I did talk to Paul about it, and he said it's a drug that's that's not really weight sensitive, so I don't know how much you weigh, but it's possible if you want to stay on enzalutamide to cut the dose in half. And it still may be effective. So I talked to your oncologist, you know, about the dosage but it was really messing with my head, no question. It's a tough drug. Yeah, this is Jake. I agree with that. It, it definitely messes with your head. <laughs> um, but it worked for me. It worked for 30 months. So, you know, it, there's fatigue. There's some mental uh, fogginess for sure. I don't remember any foot pain or anything, but definitely the fatigue and, and the mental fogginess. But, you know, if, it's, if it works for you, I would... If it was me, I'd put up with the side effects if I possibly could, because I did yeah, get 30 months out of it. Dosage. Find out about the dosage. See if you could try yeah. a lower dose for a while and see if it allows you to get used to it a little more. Or... Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I do have the, the, a bit of the mental fogginess too, but, uh, you know, apart from that and the leg pain, I'm okay. Well, I have a couple of suggestions for both of you. I think in your case, Michael, if it were me, what I would be talking to the doc about um, is possibly some spot radiation on that L5. Because that's something you can get in Canada. That's not going to be too difficult to do. And if you think you're getting sciatic pain and it could be coming back to the L5, I think I would be pushing my doctor to um, to do two or three shots um, on of radiation on L5 and see if that relieves it. You mute. You're muted right now, Michael. No, thanks. Yeah, I'll talk to him about that. I mean, I definitely. Because it sounds to me like it might well be pressure on L5. I don't know what L5 controls, but if you've done the research and you see and you know that L5 is related to the sciatic, 
sciatic pain, then, you know, I would say that's why that is the right use for spot radiation. That's why you should be doing it. And and I've known people that have got a lot of relief from spot radiation. And as far as David Muslin is concerned, um, I would go back and switch yourself onto darolutamide. That's what I would do. So I and immediately, so Rick, I immediately sent uh, Dr. H a note and she said, no, no, no. You can go switch to abiraterone or epilutamide. Well, I, I, I don't understand, and I think you've got to have a sit down with her and ask her what the hell's going on. I mean, Len, do you want to talk about your abiraterone moving to darolutamide? Uh, yeah, I was on abiraterone for <clears throat> three months, and um, similar to the experience you had with enzalutamide, it was uh, knocking me on my butt. Uh, I had cognitive issues. I felt very fatigued. Uh, just wasn't enjoying life at all. Um, so I don't understand what the issue with um, with your doctor is with uh, darolutamide. It's this, basically the same drug as enzalutamide. Works in the same way. The only difference is it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and that's why they suspect that it doesn't have the, the side effects that enzalutamide or apalutamide have. So maybe you need to find another doctor who's willing to prescribe it for you. It's worth it. Yeah, she, her, her issue is that it's not FDA approved for, uh, for, for me because I'm, I'm metastatic and I'm not, what's the opposite of castrate resistant? Castrate sensitive. So she says it's not FDA approved for you, is what she's telling me. It wasn't approved for me either, but my doctor got it for me. Right. Um, I think it's approved. Len, isn't the 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 FDA approval non-metastatic castrate resistant? Isn't that the approval? Yeah. yeah. And 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 David is um, metastatic castrate sensitive. But, but it, um, you know, if your if your doctor knows how to play the game, he can get it for you. That's exactly right. I mean, we've heard that before, and I, you know, I I hate to bang on Doctor H, but you know, she's a very good doc, but she she, she she's busting your chops on a lot of stuff. And that's because she's been around a long time and they do it their way. And you, I can only say that, you know, as Len says, if you were with Dr. O, who's a great doc at Mount Sinai, you probably would get it. If you were with certain other docs, you might well get it. But I just don't know why she won't even try. David, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Was your metastatic diagnosis um, determined after a routine bone scan or was it a PSMA? It was it was after several PMSAs, after several exhumans and bone scans. We watched it for like a year. So you were you were metastatic on a, a routine bone scan? Not on a routine bone scan, no, it really showed up uh, on, on the first PMSA but it showed up like I had like six of them on my ribs, but I had broken a bunch of ribs earlier. And after a while it, it, it calmed down and then the two spots really uh, got bigger and shined brighter. So the, the loophole, as far as the metastasis issue is concerned, uh, is that the, if you were negative for metastasis on, uh, on a bone scan, that's a sodium fluoride bone scan, uh, then you're eligible uh, as far as metastasis is concerned, you're eligible for um, darolutamide because the the way they ran the trial for approval, they used uh, sodium fluoride bone scans. They did not use PSMA. So if you're only positive on PSMA metastasis, as far as the FDA is concerned, you have no metastases. Um, okay. You know, because PSMA, they're still experimental. So there the are, question is, is she willing to play that game? Huh? The question is, is Dr. H willing to play that game? 
Sure, exactly what you're saying, Rick. That's exactly what, yeah, Len and I are both saying the same thing, yeah. Yeah. But you know, you're, you're suffering on the enzalutamide. Um, I mean, I wouldn't think, I don't think changing to apalutamide is gonna make much of a difference. Changing to abiraterone might, you might do a bit better on abiraterone because it works totally differently. Right. Well, let me take, how, how long uh, can I be off of the Xtandi for or the uh, enzalutamide? I guess as long as I want, but it's it, how good is it to be off of it? Depends well, on your PSA. Right, it yeah. depends on your PSA. If it if it's not going up without enzalutamide, that's great. Yeah. So do I just get off of it until I I get my uh, I'm going to have a PSA in about four weeks, so I just stay off it for a while and let my body recover, let my head recover. What was the date of your last PSA? Two weeks ago. Okay. So, yeah. Um, look, I don't, I'm not a doc. We can't give advice. If it were me, I don't think I'd be too worried about not being on it for four weeks. But right. I think that the, you know, what they've chosen with you is to, um, to go with, uh, an anti-androgen plus the ADT, and that's probably a good choice. So, right. you know, to get back on it sooner rather than later. Yeah. So I think what I, I think what I'll do is I'll stay off of it for four weeks. When I go to get my PSA test, I'll have a sit down with Dr. H and see if I can convince her to uh, to go that way. And that information is is good. Len on uh, bone scan came up negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can tell her, tell her, she'll, she knows Dr. O. You can tell her this was a patient of Dr. O's. Okay. So, you know, it's not some fly by night situation. All right, right we've got to keep moving here. Carl, Thank you, James. I, I'm just too late to say hello to Arlene. <laughs> <laughs> she was just showing me my passport that if we were to be traveling, it's there's less than a year to expiration, so I need to update my passport. <laughs> she telling you something? Is the wife telling you something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's sending me away. Um, so, uh, Glenn had mentioned Yolanda McKinney as the contact person at NIH. I had a brief discussion with her uh, right after uh, Len had given me our contact information. And just earlier today, uh, on my behalf at the Rutgers Cancer Institute, they spoke with her uh, regarding my application for the clinical trial relating to PSMA. And she's, she basically told them that she didn't want to hold out much hope for me, but that the priority at this point are for people who are already in like that what the system within NIH or currently being treated as opposed to a new new person coming in from scratch. So we'll see if anything might happen. But she also did say they they needed scans that are no no older than six months old, a uh, cat uh, scan and a bone scan. So uh, I do have the maximum uh, PET scan, which is just about six months old, uh, but I don't have a bone scan. So We'll probably be going for that. Um, and also, I had uh, my second opinion oncologist that I use is at Columbia Presbyterian. And I had a telemedicine appointment with him uh, earlier this afternoon. And uh, we talked about a lot of things, but specifically, I wanted to talk about with PSMA. And, and he said, oh, we have several really exciting clinical trials with PSMA, which I should make a really good candidate for. Um, and I said to him, I said, okay, well, I saw one of those clinical trials are with CAR T cells uh, with PSMA. So when I looked up CAR T cells, I saw that they are used primarily for treatment with people who have blood disorders like uh, uh, leukemia or lymphoma. So, uh, and not generally with prostate cancer. So 
we had a further discussion, but then he, he made a comment. He said, and, and it's also a phase one trial, which kind of, kind of concerns me because they're trying to figure out the effective dosage of the treatment. So uh, phase one, as we know, is really at the very lowest, the very beginning of, of the trial. And I, personally, I think there's a relatively high risk. So his comment to me was, well, with high risk, there could be high reward, that he's very bullish on the fact that it, there could be a curative treatment in, in one of these clinical trials for me. And uh, although it's high risk, it could be high reward. So I'm scratching my head and I'm not sure if I'm convinced of that and I want to throw that out. Okay. So Carl, so Carl yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's high, from their point of view, it's high reward. Uh, they, if they manage to show anything with CAR T cells, which my reading is has not been successful in any kind of prostate cancer. They've been mostly successful in not solid tumors. Although melanoma has also been shown to have some effect. But the question is, you're way asking simply for a scan for diagnostic purposes, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yes. So in order, and then to put you in a trial of CAR T cells based on your asking about a scan doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, but then the question, you know, again, we pointed it out just before that UCLA will let you get a scan for 3K. Yeah, is th this is um, this isn't Drake. This is the other doctor, Mark Stein, who who, Stein. who is is the right hand man to Charles Drake. Yeah. Right, but this is this is Stein. Um, you know, I, I I get a little worried. I have to say, um, I get a little worried. New York Presbyterian, because of all the different institutions I hear, um, they seem to be the slickest snake oil salesman when it comes to trials. Um, I've just heard it too often from too many people. And I don't know why, but I don't like it. I mean, trials are great, but as, as, as Carl said, to talk you into a trial, when really all you want is a PSMA scan, um, there's something wrong with that. I'm just saying, just saying. Um, now, uh, I'm not surprised about NIH because Herb told us this a couple of weeks ago that they're not taking new patients. So, um, from your perspective, let me interrupt and say, Carl, the minute I hear that the clinical center is expanding its patient load, I will let us let this group know. And I will hear the post haste. I mean, I'm in the loop on that information. But right now, I mean, even my own appointments with the NIH Cancer Center, which on campus where I am, a telemedicine. Um, I'm, I'm just sort of going back to your situation. And I mean, the issue is for you is that your PSA is starting to creep up, right? That's the issue. Right, it's still so very low at 0 0.14. But it's still starting to creep up. Well, first of all, you're not going to get much of a result out of the PSMA until you get to a higher level anyway, right? So just as some common sense, it might be better just not to drive yourself nuts with this, at least for another two or three months and see how your PSA goes. And then, you know, what if, if, God forbid you get up to the area of around 0 0.5, then start worrying because we know at 0 0.65, 0 0.8, 
you're gonna something will show. But if they said, yeah, come in tomorrow, you'd say, no, thank you, because my PSA isn't high enough, right? Yep. So I know this, you have to manage the anxiety, and I know it's easier for me to say, easy for me to say. But right now, um, I wouldn't be driving myself nuts uh, over, over getting a scam, because you, there's nothing to scan. As far as the as far as these clinical trials are concerned, um, again, at zero point one four, there's not enough motivation to make a change to do to do a new treatment for me. I mean, do you have a number in mind where you say, when I hit this number, I have to be in a new treatment? Interesting question. Um, only from past experience when uh, I was on Zytiga and it was on it for six months before my PSA went from 0 0.13 to 0 0.55 and uh, within a matter of between two to three months and that's when we switched over to uh, Olaparib as a result of the genetic testing. The rest of the history, as far as being very, very effective for me up until now. So uh, the magic number, you know, it, it, it's concerning to me with the acceleration within a relatively short period of time. But I also do understand it's a pretty damn low number. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I defer to the uh, gurus and experts, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, uh, I don't know if I want to wait necessarily to 1.0 if I'm at 0 0.14, but somewhere between 1.0 and, and what I'm at currently, I, I would expect. You would want to switch. Um, well, you know, I think that what I would be, I think what I would be looking at, given, given that you have that you have the germline bracket. I would be getting what's her name involved again from um, at, at, Philly, at, at University of Pennsylvania. What's the Susan? Right, uh, Su uh, Susan Dumchek, and and I did email her with my situation, um, and she came back with me to say, well, I really don't know much about prostate cancer. I know about uh, breast cancer. But, uh, but all I can say to you is that let it ride as long as you can to keep on the lap room. All right. Well, I mean, the people that know more about, I mean, I know that, I know that, um, I know Alan Ashworth is not a doc, he's a research scientist, but he has good knowledge of prostate cancer. I, Pam Munster has a good working knowledge of, of, of prostate cancer. Um, there at, UC, at the UCSF. Bracker Center, which is the other Bracker Center. Chuck Ryan has a really good working knowledge because he's been a PI for a PARP trial. And I think really what we've got to do is start talking to these guys that really understand PARP inhibitors and see what, what do they think would be the next step and what would they combine them with? Because just like, I mean, I, I can write to Anna and Ashworth, um, but I think you really need a doc because I could write to Alan and say, you know, somebody who's starting to fail, what would you think their next, pro their next treatment should be for prostate cancer? What suggestions would you have? And I can pr probably get an answer out. And if I don't, I can get it by going through Pam Munster. But, but that's not, I don't really want to be doing that. I want your doctor to be doing that. You, you know what I'm saying? So you've right. got to have a doctor who's willing to push the envelope. Have you have you asked your doctors at New, in New Jersey what they want to do when the, this treatment starts to fail? Uh, yes, and uh, well, the, Dr. Stein, we talked earlier this afternoon, uh, Dr. Soraya who's in New Jersey. Uh, I am scheduled to um, have an appointment with him on September 15th in about a month. So I, I think that both pretty much similar and on the same page based upon my actual discussion with Stein 
is that uh, it's really is too soon now um, to consider another course of treatment. I did ask about, well, is there some type of combination therapy? Is, is there something that would reinvigorate the olaparib? Uh, is there the possibility of going to the second generation PARP inhibitor? And, and the, the common consensus was that they operate very much the same. And for me to go to another PARP inhibitor would probably not be effective for me. So well, that, I think I told you um, guys, that's what Alan said on the, on the BRCA or on the um, ovarian, that they don't see a big difference with the second line. Professor Bilger, rest his soul, thought there was a difference, but now they're starting to say, no, there is no difference. Well, I, I, I just think, I, I know it's hard for you because it's not your personality, but I think you've just got to keep, you've got to stay with the game right now, keep taking the part, and, may, and, and something will emerge and will help yeah, you think through. What's interesting is that both uh, Stein and Soraya did mention at some point uh, in the past about Keytruda, and I had said, well, I'm not, I am MS stable, I'm not MSI. And they said, well, it should not really matter. It should possibly be an effective treatment for you. So I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, all I know is that you've got to be, that I've read, you've got to be MSI high. You know, right. and this is just the reverse of David Muslin's situation where they want to stick you on a drug where it isn't FDA approved because because Keytruda is only approved if you're MSI high, you know, and, and they're saying, why don't we try it? And David can't get his doctor to look at a, a really good FDA approved drug because he's slightly off the profile. Anyway, I've got to keep going. We've got three guys to get to. We've got, uh, we've got Mark, Paul, and, um, and we've got uh, Jeremy. Paul, What's on your? Tell us what's on your mind, and then we'll go to Mark, and then we'll go to Jeremy. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, ever since my prostate surgery in April of 2014, I've been incontinent and wearing Depends pads in my underwear. And um, about a month ago, I noticed that I didn't have any stains in there anymore. And so for about three weeks now, I've not been wearing the pads. I don't know yeah. if anybody is other has experienced that sort of thing, but so far, I'm so good. I'm good. And how many years after surgery is this? Yeah, about six. I wore pads for, you know, close to six years. Six years after surgery. And how long after you came off the ADT? Oh, it's about 18 months after off the ADT. Yeah. You know, you, you slowly, stuff gets stronger. Your muscles are weaker when you're on the ADT. And... That is great news, Paul. I'm really happy for you. I don't know. Anybody else have any anything to chime in on that one? Where they, you know, that, that's one of the longest periods I've ever heard, but that's gonna well, save a lot of money. <laughs> it's really not that much money, but um, but 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 the, it's you know it's convenient. I mean, I, I don't have to worry about pads anymore. Yeah, but, well, well so far, so far, you know, I, I don't want to knock on wood. I, you know, it could come back in two weeks. You know, I don't know. Were you getting those pads on Amazon? Oh, I don't get I, the pads. I get it um, at, uh, at at CVS. Okay, that's okay then. Because yeah, I was going to say, if you were getting them on oh, Amazon, it's only like, it's only like seven, seventeen dollars for fifty pads. You know, I mean, it's like it's like next okay. to nothing. I'm pulling your leg, you know that. I'm really happy for you. Anybody else want to say anything to Paul? Try the Qigong. Uh, that'll, that'll help immensely with your core. Yeah. Try, try to do what? The Qigong exercises. I put a link up there. Oh, okay. I think that could help you a lot. All right, thank you. Yeah, so in the chat window, uh, there's, a, there's a link from Jeremy. So open the chat window, you'll see it right there. But yeah, I think that that's a great suggestion. Great suggestion. And and now more than ever, probably the kegels, but your kegels are important. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
you know, don't, don't dismiss those kegels. All right, we're going to keep moving. Is that okay, Paul? Yes, very fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mark, please. Okay, uh, 69 years old, had Gleason 4 plus 3, treated with uh, Telsa Pro. Initially, I was going to get the PET, PSMA PET scan first, but because of COVID, I jumped at a slot that opened up for Telsa Pro. Um, I had a 90% drop in PSA at three months down to 0.4 and uh, got the PET scan, went back to LA and my um, seminal vesicle lit up. Luckily, nothing else lit up. And um, in talking with Amir Kish Kishan at UCLA, decided to go with Vuray MR, I guess it's MRidian, which is an MRI adaptive SBRT with five treatments, eight gray a session every other day for five treatments. So I'm planning that and I'm wondering if anybody did anything, any guidance or, or uh, thoughts about that. Um, playing with my doctor's office who said, we can get you one month of Eligard, can't get three months Eligard, can't get three months of Lupron right now. And they were gonna spend a couple of days looking for that before I go out to LA. Um, what, what, remind me again, where, where are you? Um, I'm in, um, Atlanta, Georgia. Right, 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 right. No so one in, no one in Georgia does the MRI adaptive. Um, I met with two different radiation oncologists here, and they all wanted to go with fiducials, uh, spacer, and um, 28 treatments. And right. and with the MRI, you don't need the spacers, spacer. You don't need fiducials. And it's only five treatments. Right. I mean, I think the key here is to be doing this recur. I mean, this is essentially recurrent um, surgery, recurrent radiation, salvage well, radiation. Um, even though you had focal treatment to begin with, it's salvage radiation. Yeah. And it's salvage radiation with SBRT. So, um, I'm trying to think. We had Len. Have we have we had anybody? We have had somebody who's done SBRT recently. Um, I think, uh, uh, Dennis McGuire. Yes, Dennis McGuire. But it wasn't salvage. That was for debulking. Yes, you're right. And I I just had it on my ribs. Right, 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 and. Um, but I'm trying to think if we've got experience of anybody doing it for, for salvage, which is what you're doing. Mark, I'm gonna have to look. Um, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to look for you. And if I if I find anyone, I will tie them into you. Um you. you know, I I think and and where you're getting this at, again, where UCSA, uh, UCLA. UCLA? UCLA, yeah. There are only seven centers doing the MRI adaptive now. Right. And it just seems like the safest approach because they did say with the salvage, uh, there's a potential for more risk um, and they just don't have the experience with cases after Tulsa Pro. Yeah. Um, I mean, the person Frankly, the person um, who probably knows the most about this is Alan Edel. Um, as much as the doctors, he is in LA. Um, I can drop him a line and ask him if he knows anybody who's used uh, this SBRT. Who's your, who's your doc again? You said it before. Mark Kishan, K-I-S-H-A-N. He's the head of radiation oncology at UCLA. Yeah. I've heard his name. Um, so let, let me reach out to Alan Adele for you because if anybody knows, he's he goes as tall Alan on some of the uh, forums. He's pretty widely known and um, he's a really good guy. He's on our advisory board. I think I've seen um, him on Inspire. 
Yeah, you might have seen him on Inspire. You definitely will have seen him on um, on uh, Health Unlocked. Yes, okay, that's where it was. On Health Unlocked, which we we like to call it Health Locked Out because we got all got banned from it. Hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, he's very good on it, and 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 he he has a blog which we put a reference to something in the blog earlier on today. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, I, I think I will do that for you. I mean, I don't have a lot to tell you about, about the experience. I mean, I've known several, I've known several people who have done SBRT and they, five treatments, four treatments, six treatments, depends. They've all been very happy with it. My cousin had it in Israel, um, a couple of years ago and, um, you know, side effects don't seem to be any better or worse than any, anything else. Um, so, but I can't, I can't give you, Len, any, any, any thoughts on your part? Um, not really. I don't have experience or know of anyone with experience. Um, all right. Well, I think what we'll do is, um, is we will, well, I'll, I'll reach out for you. I've got I've got a note here, and we'll do that. Jeremy. Yes. You have a question. Well, I have a question, uh, Len. You you responded to uh, something that we we don't need to get into discussion about. But other than that, um, um, I am. You guys know I'm seeking a second opinion, and I'm getting more testing done. I just got just now while I was listening to you guys, uh, my bone scan came back negative for a metastasis. Um, I actually just got an email from somebody at the Michael Milken Foundation. You know, I'm in the entertainment business, so they're yeah. coming after me. So yeah. They want to know if they can help me out. But uh, in any event, um, I, I, you know, I think I told you guys I was having some pain in my groin following the biopsy. Uh, it's now seven, eight weeks. Uh, June 8th is when I had the fusion biopsy. And I've had this ache in my groin. And I, I thought I had an infection. Who knows, you know, lymph node involvement, something. Um, it turns out, it looks like I got a hernia, probably from doing too much yoga. Because uh, 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 uh. I got... I do very aggressive yoga, you know, up on standing up over your head, you know, on your hands upside down and all that stuff. Uh, that's why I'm going to the Qigong. It's, it's a little bit more easy on the body. And, um, but I just wondered, has there any of you guys experienced any other sort of complications uh, like a hernia uh, near the prostate? Um, because I'll tell you, it feels like someone kicked me in the nuts. That's, you know, the, like, and, and that's what I got right now. I got, you know, uh, on one side, um, uh, it, you know, my testicle hasn't gone up there, but, you know, you can have part of your seminal vesicle get herniated. And I understand it is also a complication of having an enlarged prostate um, that can uh, affect all that. And plus, I've, I've got just terrible back pain. You know, um, low back pain, um, mm -hmm. and 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 then I'm just going to be going through all the testing that we talked about, the genomic testing, the second MRI, and uh, I believe also the PSMA is is uh, I'm going to be doing that as well. Um, so I don't know if it's overkill, but uh, I think it's better to have the information. <laughs> That's yeah not. yeah and in your situation i can understand why you know you want to be doubly sure i mean you know our objective yeah. um is to graduate you from this group to the active surveillance group right that, that, that's right. The, that's what we want to do yeah. you can still attend I this group too. yeah to, to listen but that's what we're aiming to do here well um, you're not the only again a, a number of uh physicians who have looked at actually looked at the biopsy report, agree with you guys, something doesn't smell right, yeah. you know? Yeah. One of the 18 samples, less than 5%, just um, doesn't 
makes sense. Well, uh, first of all, I want to ask if anybody on the call has had a um, hernia. It's pretty common um, after radical prostatectomies that people herniate. Um, when I say pretty common, I'm just guessing, but maybe five to 10% of the time, yeah. they result in hernias. Has anybody here had a hernia from after I an did. RP? I did, ah. Rick. Okay. But not after a radical prostatectomy. You didn't, after the radical prostatectomy? That was my situation, yes. Hold on a minute, who was that? I've got two people. Peter. Peter, Peter, Monica. Yeah. Peter you go first and then Scott. Um, I had what they call it an, an incisional hernia. It was more in the middle and a little higher. And that was a direct result of the uh, radical prostatectomy. But you had robotic, right? I had robotic, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. yes. Little surprise, I didn't even know it was a possibility. But after the surgery, my stomach was rather distended. And I said, gee, what's that? Oh, it's just a hernia, not to worry about it. It's but I went, I went to see a, a surgeon who does hernias. He said, well, you know, it's probably not going to bother you, but you never know. Uh, I didn't like the way it looked. So I had it done. I had it done. And it's better now. And, and what did you get the sort of pain? Did you have the sort of pain from it? No, I, I didn't have I didn't have that. Uh, I don't know if it's related or not, but then about two years later, then I had the uh, typical, what's it called, an, 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 an inguinal yeah. hernia? Yeah. That's what that it looks one, like. Yeah. I think that's what Jeremy has. Yeah, yeah I, I got that one too. I don't know if that was related to the surgery or not. Uh, you know, so... Uh, I had the bulge down there uh, in the groin area, the upper groin area, and it was sensitive to touch, but it didn't hurt. Uh, I decided to fix that one too. So I actually had two hernia surgeries since I had the prostatectomy. And Scott, what, what was your experience with the hernia after the? I, I had the, I still have it after the radical prostatectomy. And I'm just, I'm just trying to manage on the medicines and everything, and but I'm going to have to deal with that. Yes, it is, it is an issue, and, and it was a direct result of the surgery. Scott, try that qigong. I, I think it could help you out. It might burst the hernia. No, it's not that vigorous, so. Um. Yeah. Oh, so God. you know, don't we do. I don't know what to say. I don't have experience with hernias, so yeah. that, that is what it is. I do have experience with PCF and Michael and the Michael Milken Foundation. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Um, I actually do too. So um, <laughs> it's not a good one. So. You know, I mean, if you could, if you'd get it, if you could get in to see um, Jonathan Simons, Simon. It, and have a chat with him, it wouldn't hurt you. I don't know. I, I I feel I feel very comfortable with the other doctors I met at UCI that are talking with Shinoda up there and they've just been incredibly transparent and they're not you know, they're on the mindset like you guys get the information before they rush you in to slice you open. That's what so, I I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of BCF, but they they raise a lot of money privately in ways that no one else can do because of uh, Milken, and they do a good job sending it around research in institutions, and that's what they do. And I was just surprised that uh, that I got this sort of you know push to surgery from you know a, a, an establishment like City of Hope, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think everybody would disagree with that. But you know, if you if you want to run anything by Ray PCF, just let me know, and I'll, yeah. I'll I'm I'm, a, I'm an open book on that. Okay. <laughs> you know, unless you're going to give Milken money, he's not going to talk to you. So yeah, yeah. Unlike us, we talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs>
Even you, Jeremy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah. We're only eight minutes over today. That's because we had a so we had a huge drop off, which is really unusual. But thank gosh, thank goodness we did. Yeah. Um, we'll be back next Tuesday. We'll be back next Tuesday. And we'll speak to you all then, if not before. And I will, I've got my notes. I've got a follow up for Mark Perlo. And if there's anybody else, I wrote it down. So I will do it. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Hello, and good, night. Good, night. good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.